Chapter 10 is on organic chemistry. We're going to start with the historical definition of organic chemistry. In the 18th century, compounds were classified as organic if they were produced by living organisms. That meant you could not make them or synthesize them from anything that was not living, which we call inorganic compounds. So inorganic compounds are compounds that are not made by living organisms. For example, rocks and minerals would be examples of inorganic compounds. This definition had to be changed because in 1828, Friedrich Wohler synthesized an organic compound from two inorganic inorganic compounds. He was trying to produce ammonium cyanate and in order to make ammonium cyanate he reacted ammonium chloride with silver cyanate. He didn't get what he expected. He ended up creating urea and silver chloride. Urea is found in urine which we know is found created by living organisms. So the definition of organic chemistry had to be changed because he used two inorganic compounds and then ended up synthesizing an organic compound. Our current definition of organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contain carbon. We learned previously in the semester in chapter two about elements and we learned the four most abundant elements that are necessary for life. We could remember those by H O N C or honk. And so we had hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Um, so when we learn about organic chemistry, again, that has to do with compounds that contain carbon. But the organic compounds that we're going to learn about are going to be primarily carbon bonded to hydrogen and then oxygen and nitrogen, and then a few other elements in addition to make up organic compounds. But they always have to contain carbon, and they pretty much always contain hydrogen as well. Now, organic compounds can occur naturally or are prepared synthetically. So for example, if we look at vitamin C that we might extract from an orange and we were to compare the structure to vitamin C in a vitamin over here, and if we compared the actual chemical structure, those two would be exactly the same. So whether we get vitamin C naturally or if it's you know bought at the drugstore, the actual chemical structure is the same of both of those compounds. Now, organic chemistry is, again, compounds that contain carbon. Inorganic chemistry is the study of compounds that do not contain carbon. So if we want to compare how many organic compounds there are to inorganic, there are more than 10,000 known organic compounds. This is a number that is constantly changing because chemists are synthesizing new compounds. They're doing study to treat um, you know, different diseases out there coming up with different pharmaceutical products and primarily those are going to be organic compounds. So this number is constantly increasing. In organic chemistry, again, there's studies going on as well coming up with new compounds, but if you look at the numbers, 1.7 million versus 10 million, there's a lot more no known organic compounds than there are inorganic. And again, this has to do with carbon and the unique properties of carbon that we'll be studying in this chapter. There are a number of different ways that we'll be learning about how to depict the structures of organic compounds. We're going to start by reviewing molecular formula. So a molecular formula tells us what elements are present in your compound and your subscript tells you how many atoms you have of that specific element. So in this first one here, for example, we have two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. So molecular formula again tells us the number of atoms of each element in your molecule, but it doesn't tell us how they're put together. So for example here, the two black balls would represent my two carbons. The yellow balls represent my hydrogens, so I've got my six hydrogens. And then the red ball represents my oxygen, but it doesn't show us how you put them together. Now a structural formula this shows how these atoms are bonded to each other. So it shows you the number of atoms plus where the bonds are between the atoms. Um, so if we look at the first one here, we have ethanol, and ethanol is drinking alcohol. There's different types of alcohols that we'll be learning about. Um, so in this one, if we look at the number of carbons, we have two, and we have six hydrogens and one oxygen. The compound below is called dimethyl ether. And again, if we count our carbons, we have two carbons, six 
hydrogens and one oxygen. So they both have the same molecular formula, but it's their structural formula of how those bonds between the different atoms are put together that makes these two compounds behave completely differently. They have two different structural formulas. So in ethanol, we have a difference here of an oxygen bonded between a carbon and a hydrogen. In the ether, we have an oxygen between two carbons. The way these atoms are put together makes these compounds behave differently. As we know, ethanol at room temperature, its physical state is a liquid. Ether, which is an anesthetic, is a gas at room temperature. So the properties of your compound depend on its structure, not its molecular formula. So some other physical properties of these compounds, we have physical state at room temperature. We can think about maybe boiling point. The boiling point of ethanol is 78 degrees Celsius. Um, the boiling point of ether is negative 23 degrees Celsius. So again, different physical properties depending on how these atoms are put together. Um, ethanol is not poisonous. Ether can be poisonous, uh, depending on how much you know you're given with both of those. Um, ethanol reacts with sodium and ether does not react. So again, how they chemically react with their compounds are different as well. So properties of your compound depend on the structure. So the structure is really important. We're gonna learn how to draw organic structures. So carbon bonds primarily with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and then our halogens. And again, remember on our periodic table, that would be column number seven on the periodic table where we find our halogens. And each of these atoms forms a specific number of covalent bonds um, when it's bonding with carbon. So we learned before our four most abundant elements for life, H-O-N-C, as we can say honk, and we can also use that to help us remember the number of bonds. So we can just say one, two, three, four, meaning hydrogen will form one covalent bond with carbon or whatever else it's bonding to. Oxygen will form two covalent bonds. Nitrogen will form three and carbon will form four. So I have in this table below helping you remember the number of bonds. So we just said hydrogen was one oxygen is two, nitrogen is three, and carbon is four. We have some other elements as well. If we look at sulfur on the periodic table, sulfur is right below oxygen. So that's also two, because remember you'll have your periodic table always as a guide to help you remember the bonding rules. And then halogens starts with uh, H. Okay, so H can be either hydrogen or halogen, they form one bond, one covalent bond with other elements. So let's draw the structural formula for the following compounds using our bonding rules. So first we have CH4. Carbon forms the most amount of bonds, so it's always got to be in the center. And we know carbon forms four bonds. So we can just do four single bonds around carbon. Hydrogen forms one bond. So hydrogen is satisfied as is carbon. The next one we have C2H6. So we can do carbons again in the center, surrounded by hydrogen. And then following our bonding rules, each carbon has four bonds, which gives each hydrogen a single bond. Also looks happy the way it is. Then we have C2H5Cl. So we can do two carbons. We can surround it with hydrogens because hydrogen each forms one bond. And remember, chlorine is a halogen, so it also forms one bond. It doesn't matter where we put the chlorine in our molecule, because again, remember this is three-dimensional. So chlorine has one bond, hydrogens each have one bond, carbon has four bonds. This one looks good as well. So down here at the bottom, we're gonna put carbon again in the center. We're gonna attach it to an oxygen and then we're gonna surround it with hydrogens. So the carbon has three hydrogens attached. Oxygen forms two bonds, so it's attached to a hydrogen. So here we have carbon with four bonds and we have oxygen with two bonds. So we followed all of our bonding rules for that compound. 
So why do atoms form a specific number of bonds? We're going to go back to chapter three and do a review on drawing Lewis dot structures. That will tell us why atoms form a specific number of bonds. The first thing for drawing Lewis dot structures is find out how many atoms of each kind there are in your molecule. For example, if I have H2O, that tells me I have two hydrogens and one oxygen. The next thing is to do the Lewis dot structure for each of the atoms. So if I start with hydrogen, hydrogen on my periodic table is in group number one or family one. So the number of valence electrons it has is one. So I draw one dot to represent that. I have two hydrogens. They each have one valence electron. Oxygen is in group number six. So I'm going to draw six valence electrons around oxygen. Now the next thing I want to do is count the total number of valence electrons for my molecule. So I have one plus one plus six gives me eight valence electrons. Next thing I want to do is write the skeletal structure for my molecule. Now the atom or element that has the most amount of bonding capacity is always going to be in the center. So oxygen must be in the center because it can form two bonds versus hydrogen can only form one bond. The hydrogens have to be on the outside of my molecule. The next thing I want to do is insert the electrons into my skeletal structure. I want to remember the octet rule that atoms are going to be most stable with eight valence electrons and hydrogens with two or a duet. So to insert my electrons, I start with the bonding electrons first. Bonding electrons are represented by two dots. So I put two dots between each oxygen and hydrogen because again, in order for my molecule to exist, I have to have bonds between those atoms. Then I'm going to put the lone pairs on the outer atoms. In this case, hydrogen has two electrons, so it has one bond, so it's already happy. I can't add any more electrons. That's following my duet rule. So then I'm going to add my lone pairs on the central atom. So oxygen, I've got four electrons left out of my eight. I'm going to add four electrons to the oxygen in the center. Now oxygen is following the octet rule, and it has eight electrons surrounding it. So it looks pretty good so far. The next thing I want to do is draw a line to represent my bonding electrons. So I'll draw that down here. Hydrogen, the line represents a bonding pair of electrons. And then I draw my non-bonding electrons on the oxygen. The last rule is if you need to form double or triple bonds. This only occurs if you used up all your valence electrons and you do not have eight electrons around your atom, for example, oxygen, or two around the hydrogen, then you would create double or triple bonds. So let's start by doing some Lewis dot structures for some elements. So we have hydrogen. Again, hydrogen is in column one. So it's Lewis dot structure for just an atom would be H with one dot representing its valence electron. Oxygen is in column six. So oxygen would have six valence electrons. Nitrogen's in column five. So it would have five valence electrons. And then carbon's in column four, four valence electrons. So if we want to do some molecules, we have a couple molecules to do as examples. We have C2H5Cl. So following our Lewis dot structure rules, we know how many atoms we have of each one. So we have two carbons. Each carbon has four valence electrons. I drew those a little close. Each hydrogen, we have five of them, has one. So again, this is review. And then chlorine is a halogen in column seven. So it has seven valence electrons. So then we want to put our skeleton structure together. So picking which element goes in the center of my skeletal structure is always going to be carbon because carbon can form the most amount of bonds, which is four. So I know I'm going to have to have my two carbons in the center. And then I'm going to surround them, hydrogen and chlorine, which is a halogen, the two H's, because always form only one bond. So they need to go around my carbons. Doesn't matter where the chlorine goes, because again, these are three dimensional mol uh, molecules. And then our rules say we got to total up our total amount of electrons we have here. So we have four plus four from the carbons 
we have five from the hydrogens and then seven from the chlorine. So that gives us 12 plus eight, we've got 20 electrons. First electrons are always gonna be bonding. So we draw two electrons to represent our bonding electrons. And then two between the two carbons. Okay, so right now we have used up two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. We've got six electrons left. And our rule says they're gonna go on the external atoms first. So where hydrogen has two for each, so the hydrogens are happy. So let's add our six electrons on the chlorine. We've used up all of our electrons. We have none left. And we can check to make sure that everybody has eight electrons except for hydrogen with two. So everybody looks good the way they are. Chlorine's happy, carbon's happy, the other carbon's happy, and hydrogens are happy. So the next rule says that we need to, any bonding electrons, we need to draw lines to represent that those are bonding. So our Lewis dot structure, if I wanna draw that, so it looks a little neater right next to it. And then chlorine has those six non-bonding electrons around it. Okay, so a Lewis dot structure shows non-bonding electrons versus a structural formula does not show non-bonding electrons. The next one we have CH5N. So same thing, we're gonna add up. Each carbon has four. So I'm just gonna write, I have four, I have five, because I have five hydrogens, each have one plus nitrogen has five. So my total valence electrons here are 14. Okay, so I have 14 valence electrons. How can I put my skeletal structure together? Is again, carbon's always gonna go in the center because it can form the most amount of bonds. And then it's gonna be attached to a nitrogen. And then we have five hydrogens. So let's start by putting three hydrogens around carbon, because then it's gonna be able to form four bonds, and then we can put a couple hydrogens next to nitrogen. And then we're gonna insert our electrons, and we said we had 14, so we always wanna start with bonding electrons. So two electrons between every atom. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. We've got two electrons left. We start with the external atoms. Hydrogens are happy with two. We can add two more to nitrogen. And now it looks as if carbon has eight, nitrogen has eight, and each hydrogen has two. So that looks stable. So last thing is to draw our bonds for our bonding electrons. So I'll redraw the molecule. So it looks neater over on the right. And then nitrogen has those non-bonding electrons attached to it. So that would be our Lewis dot structure for this compound. So when we're drawing Lewis dot structures, um, when we don't have eight valence electrons around an atom, we would go ahead and create double or triple bonds. So just to review what a double bond and a triple bond looks like, this is a double double bond where we have two lines between two atoms. And then in carbon, carbon can form a double bond and each of those carbons could be attached to two single bonds and there would be you know, something else attached as well. So this is just showing me the double bond and showing me that carbon can form a double bond and then two single bonds. And remember carbon can form four bonds. So that satisfies our bonding rules as well. Two singles plus a carbon plus a double equals you know four bonds or carbon can form a triple bond. And then we have a triple bond here and a single bond. And again, we'd be attached to some other type of element on the other side. Carbon can also form a bond. In this case, we're looking at nitrogen. Nitrogen can form three bonds. So nitrogen can form a double bond and a single bond, which would give us a total of three bonds, or nitrogen can form just a triple bond. And then oxygen and sulfur can both form two bonds. Okay, so oxygen can form, again, it can form two single bonds or it can form a double bond, in this case attached to a carbon, or sulfur can form, again, two singles or it can form a double bond. 
In the next examples, I want you to draw the Lewis dot structure and the structural formula for these compounds. So we'll start with the Lewis dot structure. We have C2H4. So we're going to count our total electrons available. So we have two carbons. Each carbon has four valence electrons. And then each hydrogen has one, and there's four. So we have a total of 12 valence electrons. So again, carbon needs to be in the center. We're going to surround it with hydrogen. And then we're going to insert our bonding electrons. So we always start with bonding electrons. And we've used up 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We have two electrons left. So I'm going to add those two electrons to one of my carbons. I added it to the one on the right, so this one now has eight. The carbon on the left, however, only has six. In order to be stable, it wants to be have eight following the octet rule. So what we're going to need to do is move that non-bonding pair of electrons to the center between these two carbons. And now we created another bonding pair. So now we made a double bond. So let me rewrite that here. We have carbon with a double bond attached with single bonds to these hydrogens. So that's my Lewis dot structure. My structural formula is actually going to be the same thing. Structural formula, you want to just make sure you follow the bonding rules. The carbon has four bonds. So my one on the left has two singles and a double. The one on the right, same thing. It has a double bond and two singles. So it followed the bonding rules. So this is an example where my Lewis dot structure and my structural formula are both the same. The one be below, we have C2H2. So we have two carbons. Each carbon has four valence electrons, and then we have two from our two hydrogen atoms, which gives us a total of 10 valence electrons. So we start by drawing my two carbons. We only have two hydrogens in this case. Put in our bonding electrons. So we've used up six. We have four left. So I can put two on each of these carbons. Now each of my carbons here only have six electrons instead of eight. So we can move these electrons to the center. And now this one has enough. So let's move the other pair in there. So they both have eight. So I can redraw that as a triple bond. Okay, so now carbon here has eight valence electrons and this carbon has eight valence electrons. It looks stable and hydrogen has two. So Lewis dot structure in this case is going to be the same as the structural formula. So the only difference between structural formula and Lewis dot is Lewis dot structure will always show any non-bonding electrons. In these two examples, we didn't have any non-bonding electrons. We only had bonding electrons, so it ended up their structural and the Lewis dot structure are the same. Okay, so we're going to do the Lewis dot structural and structural formula for two more compounds. So we have hydrogen cyanide. So again, counting our valence electrons, we've got one for hydrogen, four for carbon, and five for nitrogen. Gives us a total of 10 valence electrons. Putting my structure together. Carbon's always going to be in the center. And then we have nitrogen and hydrogen surrounding it. We start with our bonding electrons. We've used a total of four. We have six left. So we're going to start by putting those six on the nitrogen because we always start with the external atom first. So nitrogen is stable with eight. However, carbon only has four in the middle. So we're going to need to move some and share between carbon and nitrogen. So carbon now has six. If we move this other pair up here, now both of them have eight electrons. So let's just rewrite that with our triple bond between carbon and nitrogen and then our non-bonding electrons. So that's my Lewis dot structure. Let's do the structural formula. So it's just, again, following our bonding rules. Carbon has to have four bonds. So we've got a single bond between carbon and hydrogen. We've got a triple bond between carbon and, and nitrogen. And with structural formula, we don't show the non-bonding. So that's the difference between here. So our structural formula, there is no non-bonding electrons shown. Okay, so they're a little bit easier to do. You can just follow the bonding rules and make sure you have enough bonds between your different elements. 
Let's do this one at the bottom. We have H2CO, which is also known as formaldehyde, that embalming fluid. Let's start by counting our valence electrons. We've got two because we have two hydrogens, carbon plus four plus six from the oxygen. This gives us 12 valence electrons. So putting our structure together, we have carbon, of course, in the center. We're going to surround it with oxygen and hydrogen and then put our bonding electrons in. So we've used up six. We're going to start by making the oxygen add the additional six to that one. So again, oxygen has eight, but carbon in this case only has six. So we need to share one of those pairs from oxygen and create a double bond when we move that in. So we can redraw this down here. Double bond between carbon and oxygen. This one has four non-bonding electrons attached to that oxygen, and then our single bonds to hydrogen. So again, this is our Lewis dot structure for formaldehyde. And then structural formula, again, is making sure carbon has four bonds. We've got a double and two singles attached to my hydrogen. And then oxygen has two bonds, so our bonding rules are satisfied. So that's my structural formula for formaldehyde. Now in a structural formula like we just did, we showed every bond between every atom. A condensed structural formula is a way of showing how our bonds are attached between all of the elements in the compound, uh, but not having to draw every bond. There's a shortcut way we can do this. So this is actually going to show us the structure slash function of our compound without drawing all those bonds. So for example, if I had a carbon attached to three hydrogens, and then again, carbon has to have four bonds, it's attached to something else. We can abbreviate that CH3 and just draw CH3. Or if I had next to it maybe a carbon attached to two hydrogens, I can symbolize that by just drawing CH2. Or if I had a carbon just attached to one hydrogen, I can symbolize that with just CH. So let's look at another example. So here we're going to draw the condensed structural formula for this compound that's given. So at the end, we have a carbon attached to three hydrogens. So we can draw that by writing CH3. Now that's attached to a carbon that's attached to two hydrogens. So we can write CH2. We have another carbon with the CH2. And then we have another one. And whether you have the bonds between these two carbons here is, it doesn't matter if it's there or not. So let's just go through and draw some more CH2. I'm trying to be uniform and do it all the same. And then at the end, we have a CH3. Let me just count to make sure I've added up the carbons. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be my condensed structural formula for this compound, which is called octane, which is in your gasoline. We can draw what I also call a very condensed structural formula. So what I mean by very condensed structural formula, and you'll see this in your textbook, is when I have a repeating unit, like I have CH2, CH2, I'm writing the same thing over and over again. I can make this even more of a shortcut by doing CH3, and then I can put a parentheses and write CH2, and then outside of the parentheses, I can count how many CH2s I have, which I have one, two, three, four, five, six. If I put that outside of there, then I can draw, draw another CH3. The six outside the parentheses means multiply by six what's on the inside, so that would tell me that there's six um, carbons and 12 hydrogens. So this is what I call the very condensed. I don't know if that's proper terminology, but that's my name for it. So if I ask for condensed structural formula, you could give me either format, either the very condensed or the traditional condensed that I drew at the top. Just a review as far as molecular formula, make sure you know the terminology. If I asked for structural, show me every single bond, or condensed, or I'm not going to ask very condensed, I'll just ask for condensed, 
or molecular. So just review, molecular is the total number of atoms of each element. So in this case, our total number of carbons is eight, and then hydrogens is 18. So molecular formula, again, just to tells me how many atoms of each element. It doesn't tell me how it's put together versus structural and condensed structural actually gives me more information that tells me what my compound is. Okay, so let's do the condensed structural formula for this compound, which is called butane. This is the compound found in cigarette lighters, the fuel in there. So we start with, we have a CH3, a CH2, a CH2, and then a CH3. Or you could do very condensed, which doesn't help us a whole lot in this case, but it can shorten it just slightly. We have two CH2s in the center. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to draw the line angle drawing. So how this compound really looks is like our model that I did down here. It's not really straight across the way these carbons are drawn. We do that to, for ease on a piece of paper, 2D. Three-dimensionally, there's really bond angles that are formed. So it looks more like this zigzag format that's in the model that's down below is what the compound would really look like, the shape of it. So line angle drawings is even a more of a shortcut way. So how a line angle drawing works is let me kind of just draw out what my compound looks like by including the carbon. So we had four carbons here, and then at this carbon at the end, we have three hydrogens. The one in the center has two hydrogens. Let me make sure it looks like it's attached to carbon. And then down here, we have a couple hydrogens. And then at the very end one, we had three hydrogens attached. Okay, so everything on this page is all the same thing. These are all models of butane. The line angle drawing is done so that at every angle and at the end of every line represents a carbon. So how we would do that is I would draw basically this zigzag. Okay, so in my zigzag, the end represents a carbon. Every angle represents a carbon. And then the other end represents a carbon. And then it's assumed carbon has four bonds. So if no other elements drawn, it's assumed to be hydrogen. So the line angle drawing for butane is basically, I drew these carbons here, but it would just be my zigzag like that. That would represent butane as a line angle drawing. So again, you could imagine at every point, it's gotta be saturated with enough hydrogen so that carbon has four bonds. So I'm just drawing in an example below to show you with the line angle drawing what it represents.